Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Have you ever known someone truly incredible? Someone you didn't mind following after or around? Maybe it was a childhood friend, or maybe it was one of your parents. Maybe it was an older sibling who you looked up to and admired greatly. Or maybe it's somebody that you work with or for. We all have encountered a few of those people in our lives, people whom we admire, who exhibit great competency and teaching and leading. For me, a few of those are my father. My father was somebody I looked up to a lot. And I didn't plan to say that on Father's Day. It just worked out. So much so that it became difficult for me to distinguish what I wanted and the way that I ought to do things from the way that he did things. I also had a a professor in college who I looked up to a lot and admired, and I took as many classes as I could with him because I learned so much and I respected the way that he taught. So whatever those people may be in your life, well, Jesus is a bit like that, but today in our gospel reading, we're learning that he is much more. See, that's what the disciples did. They were following Jesus around. He had called them. He said, follow me, and they had followed him, and they'd witnessed many things, but today they were going to witness something new, something they weren't expecting, and the text tells us pretty plainly that they didn't quite know what to do after it had happened. Up to this point in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has been performing miracles and teaching with an authority that is called out by those who hear him. They ask the question, what authority is this that he teaches with? But those weren't totally unique things. God has empowered people in the past, regular humans that he's raised up to perform healing miracles and to teach with mighty authority that comes from him. And it isn't long before this in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 3 when he finally appoints all 12 of his disciples. But in our text, our Gospel text from Mark this morning, something new is about to happen. Something the disciples have not witnessed yet. And our as we gather, says that it stuns them, but I think that language is too soft. The Greek repeats the word fear twice. So in English, it translates to great fear or serious fear. Basically, they're completely terrified. But before we get to what they witness, let's lead up to that. Let's kind of walk with them as they've been following Jesus up to this point. Jesus is, after all, a great teacher, the best teacher, in fact, right? He taught the truths of God's word and his relationship with his people, the fulfillment of the law, right? And you may recall that the past few weeks we have been looking through parables. Jesus has been teaching using parables, talking about the kingdom of God and the reign of God. And he taught with authority, right? His his, the audience that's listening to him says, in amazement, what is this authority that he teaches and preaches from? Right? And in our reading today, it becomes clear by which authority he is teaching. It's not a borrowed one. But Jesus was also healing people. So far in the Gospel of Mark, he's healed a man with leprosy, thought to be impossible. He heals a man's withered hand. He heals a paralytic and commands him to walk. He's cast out an unclean spirit, and the unclean spirit tries to let slip who Jesus really is, but he doesn't let it happen. So all this has been going on while the disciples are following after Jesus, this great and admirable teacher. And then we get to Mark chapter 4, verse 31, our gospel reading for today. And Jesus is about to reveal a little bit of who he really is. He is a great teacher, 
He does do miracles of healing and much more, but he is so much more than that. So let's look at the text. So Jesus, who's been teaching via parables, he's been explaining them specifically to his disciples, and now he says, let's get in a boat and go across to the other side. And so they get in a boat and they set out. And before they know it, a windstorm arises with great waves. And the text says that the waves began to fill the boat. The the boat was already filling up with water. So this is the scene. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Maybe not on a boat, although maybe some of you have. And I can imagine that any fear I've felt over a mighty storm is probably magnified when you're standing on a boat, which is moving the whole time. But have you ever been in a storm that frightened you? I I can recall a time I was at the seminary, and the seminary in St. Louis has like these slate roof shingles. And we had, we were all sitting in the dining hall working on some homework, and like hail, like this big, just started hitting everywhere, which is the most, that's the biggest I've been like actually in the midst of. And then there was tornado sirens and things like that. A little fear creeps in, right? Well, here, this is an even scarier situation because the boat that they're in, not only is it Is it rocking to and fro from these mighty waves, but it's starting to fill up with water? And where's Jesus? What is Jesus doing in the midst of this insanely terrifying situation? He's asleep. Let that sink in for a moment. We've read this story a bunch of times, but Jesus is sleeping on a boat in the midst of the storm, and that boat is filling up with water. As Jesus is about to reveal who he is, that's really the only sort of person who can have that kind of peace in the midst of such a situation. So what are the disciples going to do? What are they going to do? They look around and they think of this admirable teacher of theirs and they wonder what the heck he's doing. And so they rouse him, but notice the address they have for Jesus here in the text. They say, teacher... Do you not care that we are perishing? It's an interesting thing for them to say to wake him up. right? First they call him his teacher, which he is. But he's about to reveal to them that he's much more than that. But they also, they don't really address him as if he's going to do anything about it. right? They don't say, teacher, can you fix this? It's almost a criticism. Teacher, don't you care about the situation that we're in. So what is Jesus' response to his disciples crying out in the midst of the storm? And I think part of the disciples crying out is they don't know exactly what to ask for. They have a sense that they need to rouse Jesus because he's the person they admire and follow, but they're not really saying that because they think that he can do anything about their predicament. It's almost like an incredulous outburst as to Jesus is sleeping in the midst of this. Don't you care what's happening? Well, Jesus responds to his disciples' cries in the midst of this mighty storm. What does he do? Well, he does some rebuking. But it's really important to note the order in which the rebuking occurs. Despite the disciples' somewhat critical outburst at Jesus, his first response when he stands up is to not rebuke his disciples, but rebuking the wind and the waves. Be quiet, be still, be at peace are the phrases that we usually read in our Bibles, but it's more forceful than that. It was a command Maybe a parent or two in here can relate to this. If it's just a madhouse on a holiday, you don't sit there and say, be still. You stand up and say, silence! Because you have the authority to do that in your own home. Well, here, Jesus exercises his authority not as some teacher, 
but as God himself. And he stands up and says, silence. The commentary, one of the commentaries I read translated this as, shut up, be muzzled. He's commanding the wind and the waves. See, despite the disciples' lackluster cry, a cry that doesn't really denote any sort of faith in Jesus' ability to handle the situation, he first handles the situation. He first addresses their need and their fear. And then once the calm is restored, the text tells us the calm is restored, he turns to his disciples and rebukes them. Why are you so afraid? What's happened to your faith? Do you have none? It's almost like he's saying that the phrase that pops to my mind is, have you forgotten who's in the boat with you? God's mercy is on full display here in this interaction between Jesus and his disciples, as well as his power and authority. Once that calm is restored, he begins to teach again, addressing the disciples, admonishing them in their fear, and having a di- redirecting their vision to him. Because it turns out that Jesus isn't just some great teacher or healer. He is, in fact, God. God incarnate. Now, of course, we know famously all the stories of the disciples, all the accounts of their interactions with Jesus. They don't fully get it after this event, do they? Right, but you, this is sort of the formulaic response to any time the divinity of Jesus is revealed. Right, we have the transfiguration as almost the exact same response that it tells us right after this what happens when the disciples realize that this isn't just some dude that is good at teaching and preaching. It says they are filled with great fear. They're terrified. Think about who's in the boat with them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being in that moment and realizing that God is right there? I think I would have the same reaction. Fear. And it prompts them to ask the question, who then is this? Remember, they've been following him around. They know his name. They know what he's about. They know what he does. But this event prompts them to ask the question, who then is this? that even the wind and the waves obey him? And the answer is God. Jesus is here to do much more than teach and heal minor earthly ailments. He is the Son of God, the Messiah, who is here to defeat sin, death, and the devil once and for all, to provide forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation to those who believe in him, and only God can do that. So what can we learn, along with the disciples here, from this particular event in Jesus' earthly ministry? Don't forget who's in the boat with you. How often do we do that? So often, right? That we have some major problem or trial or struggle or suffering going on in our life and we think that God is asleep on a cushion, not doing a thing about it. And before we leap to criticize the disciples crying out to him, we often do the same, right? Not crying out because we know or believe that he's going to fix it, but almost as a criticism for his lack of action. Don't you care that I'm going through the thing that I'm going through? Don't you care that I'm suffering? Don't you care that my loved one is suffering? Because we have storms in our life that come up, things that threaten to crumble our faith and overwhelm us with fear. Don't forget who's in the boat with you. The other thing we take away from this event is that when we do that, even if it's not a perfect crying out in faith, Jesus hears and addresses our need. He hears and defeats the thing we are afraid of by demonstrating his authority as God. 
So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you have the Son of God in your boat. He is for you. Therefore, nothing can be against you. Nothing can overwhelm you with fear. For even the wind and the waves obey him. He is God. He took his power, his divine authority and perfection to the cross. All of the majesty of Jesus on display in this event. He emptied himself of it for you. To bring a calm to the greatest storm of all, the storm of sin and death, the corruption it brought to creation. So have faith that that great storm has subsided, the calm has been restored, for you have the Son of God in your boat. He has risen victorious over all of those things. And as the scriptures tell us, he is God and all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. This is the one who speaks for you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, who is Lord of all, until he comes again to make all things new. Amen. Please rise.